So um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be presenting at the AS conference, and I'm truly excited to be here. Today I'm going to speak about the evolution of exploiting memory vulnerabilities in Linux, something that I'm very passionate about, vulnerability research and exploit development. But before I start, a little bit about me. My name is Afri Ozan. I'm a security researcher. I'm passionate about vulnerability research, exploit development, and developing automating tools. I like to share my findings and insights with the cybersecurity community, so this is why I'm standing here. Um, I'm writing blog posts and documenting my researches. You can find everything on my Medium page. For those of you who want to reach out, you can do that via LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and I hope you enjoy my talk today. So today we're going to explore the evolution of exploiting memory vulnerabilities in Linux. I assume that some of you are familiar with memory vulnerabilities, perhaps haven't experienced exploiting them, and probably encountered the sense of the security mechanisms. But today I'm going to give you some further insights into the cat and mouse game between attackers developing exploits and defenders crafting security mechanisms. So we're going to start with covering some user one attack techniques that were developed by attackers in the past, and as a result, the development of security mechanisms. We're then going to understand the transition attackers made from exploiting memory vulnerabilities in the user mode to the kernel mode, and as a result, the development of security mechanisms in the kernel mode too. I'm then going to cover some modern privilege escalation techniques um, that are being used by attackers today to perform the malicious actions. And then we're going to understand what does the future hold for attackers trying to exploit memory vulnerabilities in Linux. So it's important for me to mention that we're going to focus on Linux only, not on Windows, and on Intel implementations for security mechanisms. So we'll start with reviewing the history. Linux released the first version of Linux, um, 0 0.01. It was released in September 1791. During those early days, memory regions were readable, writable, and executable. And memory addresses were hard-coded, which means that every time a program was loaded to memory, it was loaded to the same memory addresses. And because of the lack of security mechanisms, attacks were pretty simple compared to today's standards. But it doesn't matter if there are security mechanisms or not. Attackers have three primary tasks in order to successfully exploit a memory vulnerability. The first need to find the vulnerability. They then need to manipulate the execution flow of the program that will point to a memory address that contains the malicious action, and then to execute the malicious code. So they need to find the vulnerability they then need to make sure they're redirecting the execution flow of the program to the correct memory address that contains the malicious code. And then they need to make sure that this memory address is executable so they can execute the malicious actions. So I've prepared a timeline showcasing the evolution of Linux uh, security mechanisms to help you follow the Linux progression throughout the years. Uh, this timeline covers all the security mechanisms that were developed in Linux. You can see the kernel versions, and the date releases of each one of them. But because my time is limited today, I want to be able to cover all of them. So we're going to focus on this blurred version of the timeline. So we're going to cover NX, SLR, SMAP, SMAP, KSLR, and control flow protection. In the top right corner, you can see the section of the timeline that will be discussed in each one of the slides. So we'll start with reviewing the years prior to 2004, before NX was developed. One of the earliest publications that covered how to exploit memory vulnerabilities was Smashing a Stack for Fun and Profit. It was released by Aleph One in November 96. This publication um, explained how attackers can use a program that stores the buffer in the stack and doesn't check for its boundaries to manipulate the control flow of the program and execute a malicious action. So it explained how you can inject a malicious code 
to the buffer, overflow the buffer until you reach the saved return address, overwrite the saved return address with the memory address of the malicious code, and open a shell. The shell that will be opened will be under the process privileges. So if the process privileges was higher than the user, then the user will escalate its privileges. And what maybe made it possible was that the stack was readable, writable, and executable, as I mentioned. So attackers could successfully write to the stack and also execute code from it. And the other thing is that memory addresses were static. So attackers could analyze the program before exploiting it, find the memory address they want to use, and reuse them and it will work. So as a result of injecting shell codes, Linux released NX, which is an abbreviation for non-executable. It's also known as DEP, XN, and XD, and it was released in 2004. NX is a hardware feature that prevents execution from memory regions by marking them as non-executable. For example, the heap and the stack are memory regions that store data and they shouldn't be executable. And since NX was released, memory regions started to be governed by the following access flags. So the first one is read-only and non-execute, which is used to protect memory regions that store data that was already resolved in the load time of the process. For example, the raw data segment. The second one is read, write, and non-execute, which is used to protect memory regions that store data that needs to be resolved at the runtime of the process. For example, the data segment. And the third one is read only and execute, which is used to protect memory regions that contain the actual code and need to execute the code, like the text segment. So NX basically implements WXORX, which means that memory regions can be either writable or executable. They can be both. For example, the stack that stores data shouldn't be executable. On the other hand, the text segment, which stores the code, shouldn't be writable because the code was already compiled. So NX prevents attackers from injecting their shell codes because they can't write to memory and execute code from it. Here you can see the output of the readlf l command um, that presents that memory addresses are governed by access flags. In the bottom, you can see the stack that is only marked as read and write when NX is enabled. So NX prevented attackers from injecting the shell codes. So they needed to think about new ways to successfully exploit memory vulnerabilities. And they came up with code use attacks. In code use attacks, attackers are utilizing existing code that is already loaded to the memory with execute permissions. And one of the common ways to do that is using the RET instruction to redirect the execution flow of the program to the malicious code. Attackers like to target the libraries because they already contain functions that can be easily utilized by attackers. And one of the common techniques is called RET to libc. LibC is a library that provides the C functions to the program. So attackers could, for example, call the system function, send it the slash bin slash state string, and it will open a shell with the privileges of the running process. So in order to perform, perform read to LibC attacks, attackers first need to locate the memory address of the system function and to find a pointer that points to the slash bin slash state string because system only get pointers. So they need to find a vulnerability. In this case, it's a buffer overflow vulnerability. Then they need to redirect the execution flow of the program. So you can see they overwrite the saved return address with the value of the memory address of the system function. And then they need to execute a malicious code. So they're sending the slash bin slash sh to the system function, and it will open a shell. So since NX alone didn't prevent attackers from exploiting memory vulnerabilities, Linux released ASLR. ASLR is an abbreviation for address space layout randomization, 
and it was released in 2005. SLR prevent attackers from predicting memory addresses in user space by adding random offsets to memory regions. So after SLR released, the process will be loaded to different memory locations. So attackers won't be able to predict the memory addresses they need to use. However, when SLR released, it had some limitations. The first one is that it had a low entropy, especially in 32-bit programs. Entropy is the thing that determines the extent of randomization. So if the extent of randomization is low, attackers can use some brute force techniques to bypass SLR. They can use memory spraying and nobslets to increase their chances that their malicious code will be executed. The second one is that SLR initially only randomized the stack and the libraries. So SLR made it harder for attackers to perform read to libraries techniques because libraries are randomized. However, attackers found ways to uh, use the return to uh, techniques and they returned to non-randomized locations in memory. For example, the text segment wasn't randomized, so if the code contained enough uh, code pieces or functions that can be utilized by attackers to perform malicious actions, they would use the red to text attacks instead of handling the SLR. But SLR then extended to also randomize the base address of the executable and the heap. So attackers need to find new way and one of the common ways that are being used by attackers today to bypass SLR is performing memory leaks. In memory leaks, attackers are leaking memory addresses that will help them find the random offset that SLR is adding to memory regions. And once attackers know that uh, random offset, they can calculate every memory address they need. In the past, attackers um, used memory leaks in files within the slash proc directory, but then Linux restricted the access by unprivileged users to these files. But attackers still find ways to perform memory leaks, and this is one of the common techniques that is being used today. And when SLR is bypassed, code use attacks are becoming relevant again. And when code use attacks became more prevalent, attackers invented the oriented programming techniques. In oriented programming, attackers are chaining executable gadgets to perform their malicious actions. Gadgets consist of one or more assembly instructions that end with execution redirection. Think about oriented programming like small pieces of assembly code um, that's called gadgets, that when, atta when attackers are chaining them, they're used to perform a big task, like execute a malicious action. Oriented programming techniques are divided to backward edge and forward edge. In backward edge, gadgets are ending with the red instruction, also known as ROP, return oriented programming. And in forward edge, gadgets are ending with an indirect jump or a call instructions, also known as JOP, jump oriented programming, and PCOP, pure core oriented programming. Here you can see an exploit of a CVE that used oriented programming techniques. Uh, you can see that the gadgets are ending with either red instruction or an indirect jump. And oriented programming techniques can be combined used together, like you see in this example, attackers used both ROP and JOP. But as more security mechanisms were developed, in the user mode, it made it increasingly challenging for attackers to successfully exploit memory vulnerabilities in the user mode. Although attackers found ways to bypass these security mechanisms, it wasn't as easy for them as it was before, and in some cases, it was even impossible to exploit. However, these security mechanisms didn't affect the kernel. So attackers decided to transmit from exploiting memory vulnerabilities from the user mode to the kernel mode. And a new attack technique was released called 
red to user. In red to user, attackers are exploiting a memory vulnerability in the kernel, and they redirect the execution flow of the program to the user space. And what made it possible was that the kernel had read, write, and execute permissions to access the user space. And some of you may ask why would attackers want to redirect the execution flow from the kernel to the user? So the reason is that it was unlikely to find ways to elevate privileges in the kernel mode. Uh, because attacks, attackers don't really have control over the kernel, but they do have control in the user space. So they can exploit a memory vulnerability in the kernel, redirect the execution flow of the program to the user space, where they already created a payload and execute a payload that will perform the malicious action. So here you can see an exploit of a CVE from 2010 that performs read to user. In this example, attacker uh, is exploiting an integer, integer underflow vulnerability in the kernel, redirect the execution flow of the program uh, from the kernel to a fake structure that they created in the user space which results in copying data from the kernel space to the user space. And as a result of red to user attacks, Linux released SMAP and SMAP security mechanisms to prevent them. SMAP is an abbreviation for Supervisor Mode Execution Prevention, and it was released in 2011. What SMAP basically do is to prevent execution of user mode code from the kernel mode. SMAP is almost the same as SMAP, but it prevents access from the kernel mode to the user mode. And it was released in 2012. Access means read and write permissions. So after these two security mechanisms were released, the kernel mode couldn't access the user mode with read, write, and execute permissions. So it prevents read to user attacks. These two security mechanisms are controlled in the fourth control register in the 20th and 21th bits. However, attackers found ways to bypass SMAP and SMAP. And you can see that in these exploits, attackers are using simple move instructions between registers to reset the CR4 and disable SMAP. The next security mechanism that was released in the kernel called KSLR, it was introduced in 2004, but it was only enabled by default in 2017. KSLR aimed to increase the difficulty of using code use attacks in the kernel. KSLR is the same as ASLR. It prevents attackers from predicting memory locations in the kernel mode. Um, and it does that also by adding random offsets to the kernel space. However, KSLR also had limitations. So the first one was that it utilized only a single random offset in the kernel mode, in the kernel text. Um, so when attackers are finding this random offset, they can use it to calculate every memory address they want in the kernel. The second limitation is that KSLR is only randomized once at boot, which makes sense because it is the kernel, but whenever attackers are finding this random offset, they can use it until there is another boot and sometimes it can take time. So KSLR can also be bypassed using memory leak techniques. And when attackers are using memory leaks in their exploits, they usually like to use more than one to increase their chances and bypass KSLR. Here you can see uh, two CVEs that their exploits use the same memory leak methods. So we're going to cover all of them, stay tuned. Uh, the first one is the Spender's curl sims. In this technique, attackers are reading the slash proc slash curl sims file and search for kernel function pointers in it. If they find kernel function pointers, they can calculate the random offset and find every memory address in the kernel they need. However, this technique is not possible anymore since Linux released the KPTR restrict that prevents unprivileged users 
from reading the curl sims. When KPT restrict value is set to one, unprivileged users that are trying to read the curl sims will see the function pointers printed as zeros. So they won't be able to find a random offset. However, privileged users that are trying to read the curl sims will see the kernel function pointers printed to a CD out normally. The, th the second method is the series syslog. In this technique, attackers are reading the name message or some syslog files and searching for the freeing string. In this example, you can see that attackers are searching for the freeing unused string. And in the same line, they're searching for a string that starts with FF, 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 that represents a kernel memory address. If they find this string, they are checking if it's in the valid kernel memory addresses and uh, try to calculate the random offset. But this technique is also not possible anymore since Linux released the D message restrict, which prevent unprivileged users from reading the D message. So when the D message restrict value is set to one, unprivileged users that are trying to read the message will get the operation not permitted error. However, privileged users can normally read the D message and search for the freeing strings. The third method is the John Horns MinCore, which is an exploit of a CVE from 2017 that performs a heap page disclose. In this technique, attackers are mapping pages to memory and using the MinCore function to check if these pages are resident in RAM or not. If they find that they are resident in RAM, they're trying to leak the memory addresses and check if they are in the valid range of kernel memory addresses. However, this technique is also not possible anymore since the CVE was patched and new kernel versions are not affected. The fourth method is the leasiest uh, perf event open. In this one, attackers are creating a performance event and uh, trying to leak uh, the instruction pointers from them. But this technique is not possible anymore since Linux released the perf event paranoid that controls the use of performance events by unprivileged users. So when perf event paranoid value is set to greater than one, unprivileged users are trying to use the perf event sample IP um, to leak instruction pointers, won't be able to do that. And in Linux kernel versions that are higher than 4.6, the perf event paranoid is set to greater than one. Today, this value is set to four by default. Last method I wanted to cover is one that's used in an exploit of a CVE from 2019. Um, this one used a rest condition in the K message to expose critical information, the RSP and the R11 registers, um, that their values will help the attacker to calculate memory addresses in the kernel that they need. So until now, we covered NX, SLR, SMAP, SMAP, and KSLR. And we saw that each one of these security mechanisms can be bypassed using multiple techniques. Which leads me to speak about how do attackers are using these techniques to perform their malicious actions, and specifically to escalate their privileges. So one of the common ways to escalate privileges is changing the credentials of the running process. In this technique, attackers are using only two functions, the per kernel cred and the commit cred. When attackers are calling the per kernel cred function and send the zero value, that represents the, the root UID. The prepare kernel code function allocates a credential structure with the root user privileges. Attackers then send this credential structure of the root user privileges to the, the commit queries function that is responsible to apply the credential structure to the running process. So attackers escalate privileges by 
setting uh, a new credential structure with higher privileges to the running process. Here you can see an example of a CVE from 2023 that performs this technique. First of all, attackers are locating the memory addresses of prepare kernel cred and commit cred functions after by bypassing KSLR, of course. And then they're using a shellcode to perform the exploit. So you can see that they first zeroes the value that is being stored in RDI using SOAR RDI RDI. The value in RDI will be sent to prepare kernel cred, which will allocate a credential structure, it will be stored in RAX. They then move the value from RAX to RDI, which will be sent to the commit creds function, which will apply the new credential structure to the running process. Another common technique that is being used by attackers to escalate their privileges is using the mod probe. Mod probe is a user mod script that is responsible to manage the kernel modules by adding and removing them to the kernel. The modprobe command path is slash bin slash modprobe. However, attackers found that there is a kernel symbol called modprobe path that is located in a writable page. So attackers thought, what if they can change this modprobe path value to their own privilege escalation script, and whenever modprobe is triggered, it will execute their script instead of the slash bin slash mod probe. And they were right, which raised the question why Linux doesn't prevent write permissions to this kernel symbol. And I don't really know the answer, so if one of you knows, please let me know. So attackers can use this privilege escalation technique, and they can do that by first locating the mod probe path kernel symbol after bypassing KSLR. They then need to create the malicious user mod script that performs the privilege escalation and overwrite the mod probe path to the path to the user mod script. And then they need to somehow trigger mod probe. But how can they do that? So they found that whenever there is a file with an unknown signature, an unknown magic number that Linux doesn't recognize, there is an order of functions that are being executed, and one of them is the call mod probe function. So what they can basically do is create a trigger file with an unknown signature, execute it using some execute functions, and it will trigger the call mod probe. The call mod probe will then search which path it needs to execute um, using the mod probe path kernel symbol and it will see the attacker's privilege escalation script, and it will execute it. So here you can see an exploit of a CVE from 2023 that performs that. Attackers are first locating the memory address of the mod probe path, and then they change the sbin directory to the slash temp. So whenever uh, the slash bin slash mod probe path will be tried to execute, it will execute the slash bin slash mod, the slash temp slash mod probe instead. So attackers need to create this file that contains the privilege escalation uh, script. And then they need to create the trigger file that will trigger the mod probe. So you can see that this file contains FFFFFFFF, which is, says noth nothing, like it's not a valid signature. So whenever Linux is trying to read it, it won't recognize it. And as we know, it will trigger the call mod probe. So attackers are calling the system function and executed slash temp slash trigger. And as we know, our user mod script uh, will be executed instead. When I performed this research, I analyzed many exploits. There were a lot of them. And Something I noticed is that attackers are using oriented prog programming techniques in most of their exploits. They use oriented programming techniques to bypass NX, SMAP, and SMAP. They use them to perform malicious actions. Like basically every single action in their exploit uh, is performing using oriented programming techniques. So Linux understand that is one of their huge threats when it comes when it comes to 
exploiting memory vulnerabilities, and something has to be done in order to prevent them. So Linux started working on implementing the control flow enforcement security mechanism of Intel. Control flow enforcement is consists of IBT, indirect branch tracking, and shadow stack. Indirect branch tracking um, is supposed to prevent attackers from using the forward edge oriented programming techniques, the GOP and PCOP ones. And in order to do that, it uses the compiler that is responsible to insert and VR instructions after an indirect brand, a direct jump or a call. And the processor is responsible to enforce the presence of these NBR instructions after an execution of an indirect jump or a call. So when attackers are trying to chaining their gadgets, the processor will identify that there is another instruction that is trying to be executed after a call, for example, and it will identify that it's not the NBR, it will trigger a control protection exception and the program will crash. On the other hand, Shadowstack uh, is supposed to prevent attackers from using the backward edge oriented, oriented programming techniques, the ROP ones, and it does that by creating an isolated Shadowstack in addition to the normal stack uh, that is located in an inaccessible location and stores only return addresses. So whenever there is a call to a function that is being executed, the saved return address is going to be pushed to both stacks, the shadow one and the normal one. And when there, there is an execution of a red instruction, these two return address are going to be popped and compared. If Linux will identify that these, uh, these addresses are not equal, it will trigger the control protection exception that will crash the program. So about the implementation. I use the readlf-n command to check if CT is enabled in user mode programs. And as you can see, both indirect branch tracking and shadow stack are being enabled in the features. I also used the GDB debugger and the DSAS command to check if there are end bar instructions after calls to functions. So you can see that after a call to each function, there is an NBR64 instruction. NBR64 is the same as NBR, but is, it is being used by 64-bit programs. However, in the kernel, control flow enforcement is partially uh, implemented. You can see in our timeline that Linux released indirect branch tracking in the kernel in 2022. However, Shadowstack is still not released. I know that is, it is being developed and I assume that it will be released in the near future. And I'll finish my talk with this visualization of the timeline I created. I added some vulnerabilities uh, that are famous and have names and available exploits to demonstrate that although there are security mechanisms, it doesn't seem like attackers are slowing down I assume that we will see the effect of the control flow enforcement in the near future, and I hope that this timeline will look differently in the next few years, but this is how it looks like right now. And I'm going to release my publish uh, behind this talk, the full uh, research. Uh, the talk is only part of it. It's going to contain some further, um, uh, some other security mechanisms in the kernel and in the compiler level, and also uh, other uh, attack techniques that are being used by attackers to perform the malicious actions. So it's going to be published on my Medium page. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, it was a pleasure to be speaking about the evolution of exploiting memory vulnerabilities with you. Thank you so much. Someone have questions?
Okay, great. Thank you.